So, I'm here with the main man, Modestus Bukowskis, former Cage Warriors light heavyweight champ and now UFC light heavyweight. How are you and how have you been coping through lockdown? Yeah, doing really well, good, thank you, mate. Um, it's been actually um, not that bad, to be honest. I mean, like yeah. I said, a lot more fortunate than other fighters um, in, in the terms that, you know, I'll, I'll go downstairs and I've got my own home gym. Uh, you know, that my dad built for me and stuff. And obviously, I've got my head coach literally in the door right next to me. So, really, you couldn't ask for much of a better setup than that. You know, when lockdown happened, much of the training didn't really stop. Uh, we kept continuing with what, you know, me and my dad were working on. And then just, mm -hmm. like I say, just adding more runs and, and you know, stuff like that in there. And uh, adding, like, diff different, you know, focusing on, on different areas. I was able to drill a lot more, like... A lot of times in fight camp, you're you're either sparring a lot, you're doing different moves, or whatever the teacher wants to sort of train you. But right mm -hmm. now, I was able to do everything specifically, you know, what I wanted to do, and not only that, to go over moves that I done that I you know done previously. So it just sharpened my 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 skill set that I've <laughs> had, which is which is amazing. So and then you know as lockdown sort of eased off, and you know sort of bending the rules a little bit here and there. But come on now, do you know what I mean? It's got to be yeah. done preparing for the fight. But listen, when you have a home gym, your training partners come to you. Uh, you get the job done. Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day, um, I couldn't have asked for any better pre preparation. If anything, probably got the best preparation I've ever had because, like I said, everything specific to myself. I've got amazing training partners and coaches. Yeah. Everything to make me as good as I am. And they don't care, like, about, okay, they don't care if their skill set or whatever. But obviously, I feel that both our skill sets are improving just by us, you know, by them helping me, I'm helping them sort of thing. So, yeah. it's a system we've got and, like I said, I think I'm coming out of lockdown even better, even stronger, and just an overall more dangerous athlete. Yeah, because as I was saying, with athletes, you you have to live quite a, a secluded life anyway in training camp and quite almost lockdown. Without lockdown, it usually happens during fight camp. So fair play for you for that. And I'm going to start off, obviously, Cage Warriors like heavyweight champ, and then you move to the UFC. How does that call up come? Because a lot of fans like me, don't really understand. Do you get a, a contract with Diana knocking at your door, a golden contract saying sign here? Do you get a call? How does it all go down? Well, <laughs> basically, you just sort of, I don't know, you just got to make some noise, isn't it? Like, yeah, I, there's a couple of different factors. One being you have to be top level opposition in your last yeah. at least three or four fights. You've got to show that, you know, you're not beating guys with, you know, losing records. You've got to, you know, you've got to at least beat, you know, some credible opponents. That's one sort of big thing. So then they know, OK, he's not just beating tomato cans. Like, he can beat some le yeah. legit competition. Uh, another route, actually, the route that a lot of people are, are taking these days and one that I was actually thinking that I was going to do was to go to the Contender Series. It seems like oh, right. yeah. the best way yeah. now to get to the UFC because... There's just so many fighters now, like that they've signed, especially from the contender series. That exactly. uh, the the rosters, you know, obviously <laughs> too full now. Like they they actually need to make more cuts and stuff like that to to, yeah. to up the 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 numbers because you know each fighter is obligated to have three fights in one year. So obviously, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with an influx of fighters, I mean, they don't sign no one outside of you know contender series like in just normal yeah. regional promotion. I think yeah. four four people got signed like that last. The second, yeah, yeah, like the second guy this year to get signed like that, like literally just oh, okay, we're gonna give you a four fight contract, not yeah. last minute or anything like that. Usually, guys get called up last minute and they get signed because they're they're ready and they've got a good record. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. But one one big thing is is obviously the management. Your management has got to be top notch, which I personally have, which I'm very grateful and thankful for. Everyone at Iridium Sports Agency have literally led my <laughs> career direction as soon as I signed with them so mm -hmm. I signed with them after I won the Cage Warriors title fight and you know even then there, there there was talks that you know like listen when when the matchmaker of the UFC reposts your finish on his personal Instagram yeah. page you know they're watching do you know what I mean doing something I mean, right like, exactly do you know what I mean I think it's a case of being noticed you just have to get noticed the only way you're going to get noticed is you finish people and you fight mm -hmm. good opponents so if you put those two together there's really no way that the UFC aren't going to be watching you and yeah. If it's not contender series, it's either last minute call up, like I say, two, three weeks notice, or, you know, you're just that good that they want to sign you to a four fight contract straight away, which is pretty much what happened with me. Because uh, yeah. the, the ultimate fighters being sort of put on hold at the moment as well. So <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's, that's sort of 
another way that fighters used to be able to get in. But as I say, for the last few years, it hasn't even been happening. So it mainly is either put on a, a massive show in your own respective sh on your own respective shows, aka okay, Cage Rose, Bellator. But now it's it's more contender series, isn't it? Yeah, I mean. To be honest, I think they look at a lot like what are the main promotions around in the world, like the ones where they mm -hmm. have the best talent. So, yeah. Cage Warriors is notorious for for signing like Mike Bisping. That all the best British yeah, talent yeah, yeah. are signed from Cage Warriors, so they are always keeping a massive eye on them. LFA is another one. You know, they they look at the some of the top American talent coming from LFA as well. You know, they 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 got loads of you know they they have their eyes on certain people, you know, and certain yeah. promotions which is where you sort of want to funnel yourself into. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people get caught up into contracts with Bellator and Brave and stuff like that, and they might actually hinder your chances yeah. of UFC. Um, but again, everyone's different. And like I say, as long as you've got a great management and, you know, they're, they're, they're talking... Because like I said, at the end of the year last year, I thought, you know, contender, from what my manager was saying, mm -hmm. it's probably not contender series is where we're going to have to go because, you know, they're, they're just not signing guys. But then, you know, yeah. I wake up in the morning... Uh, literally three o'clock in the morning to <laughs> take a piss, and then next thing you know, I see that my manager's called me like literally five times. Man. I thought I'm awake, I might as well call him. And then he told me I got into the UFC. So, uh, you know, then putting in good words for you, you know, having a good management, fighting for good, <coughs> being good guys, it's yeah. it's quite a lot that you need to do, and you need to be marketable. If they think they can sell you, yeah. they they will they will sign you. Uh, so, uh, before I'm going to take it back to before you even went into Cage Warriors, you got a relationship built with one of the greatest MMA fighters of all time, training, inspiring with John Jones out in America. Tell us a bit about that. How did that come about? Um, well, so my sponsor at the time, he uh, he got me a trip out to Albuquerque after my first pro fight. Yeah. This is when they just moved to that facility. I'm talking yeah. like the walls were still hanging off. Like they had all the equipment. Wow. And stuff. Mm. Everything was quite plain. They just mm -hmm. moved into the building. Uh, there wasn't that many fighters there, so not that many heavyweights, but there was enough to train. And obviously, I had Andre Olovsky there as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I earned the respect out of all the coaches and, and, and obviously Olovsky. He actually paid for me to stay another week just to help him yeah. train, which is absolutely amazing. Especially, you know, just before, you know, my second pro fight, it gave me a lot of confidence and a lot of self-belief, you know, just mm -hmm. being trained one of the greatest heavyweights I've ever lived. Um, and doing, you know, and, and doing my thing when I was 21. And then, uh, obviously, I then went 4-0. and oh, And then I was, look, I was looking at my first ever uh, pro title fight. And then just before that, you know, I figured, why don't I go to Albuquerque when, you know, all the best fighters are going to be there. Yeah. And, you know, surely enough, you know, guys like Donald Cerrone, John Jones, you know, Cody East, you know, they, they, they had a, a wealth of people, you know, Derek Brunson. They had so many mm. good guys coming around at that time. That, you know it, it seemed like the right move so literally the day after my birthday uh, when i turned 22 i went out there and um yeah like literally the first day i came into training i saw john jones into the, and now for me this guy is like my my freaking idol like you know what yeah I, mean? like, I was very starstruck i was like damn this is john jones you feel like feel like a, <laughs> a, you know like a little school girl going up to a yeah club. that's literally what it was like <laughs> and Mate. then yeah he actually come up to me because I think, you know, I guess, you know, I obviously went up to myself, went up to him and introduced myself and stuff like that. But, you know, I think word had been going around that I was quite a good striker. So he, uh, he also came up to me and, you know, we introduced ourselves. And yeah, like I said, we, we started training. And like I said, you have to earn those guys' respect through, you know, showing a bit of, like, like I said, you just got to show respect. At the end of the day, I'm not there to fucking try and, you know, kill, kill the guys and try and make a yeah. name for myself in the gym. I'm yeah. there to better myself and better them at the same time if I can and that's exactly yeah. the moment I went into it and then that's why I think then we slowly started building a friendship and then as the time went you know as days went on and we started training more together he he saw he saw the skill set in me and the potential and we, we ended up like sparring pretty much almost every day when I was out there for 10 weeks so you know we we had like a long period of time where we just like, you know, train inspiring. I got to talk to him. I got to see what he's like as a person. He's an absolutely amazing fellow. Like for me, the, the main thing I took from that was that I will be able to compete with some of the best in the world at, at mm -hmm. one, at one point in my career, right then my, my skill set was still a little bit raw for MMA. Um, you know, but then, you know, as the years went on, my skill set just improved drastically. And yeah, 
from that moment that I knew someday it's going to happen. Someday I'm going to fight in the UFC and yeah. someday I'm going to fight at the top because if I'm hanging in there with, you know, the best fighter in the world at 22, you know, mm -hmm. I know that it can happen. And like I said, the fact that he just showed me so much respect, he's such a, like, this is why I hate when the media talks bad about him. I'm like, have you met him as a person? He is like mm -hmm. literally one, one of the most humble, like nicest guys ever. He's not, he's never trying to like do anything vicious or nasty or anything like that. Of course, you know, sometimes sparring gets a little bit heated, but nothing to yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of knock each other out. Um, but yeah, so it gave me a lot of confidence in it, and it, and it gave me a lot of, you know, law of attraction type stuff in terms yeah, of like, yeah. I'll, I'll be able to hang in there with the best in the world at some point. I just didn't know when. And like I said, now's my time to finally get to that stage. That, that leads really nicely into the next question, actually, which is obviously I've been keeping tabs on the social media recently and I've seen you've got sort of three fights this year you'd like to have. Let's say the, it's the end of next year. You've really found your feet in the UFC, three or four wins maybe. Is there a fantasy fight you look at now and think oh, I could give them a hard, a hard, work's night, a hard night's work in, in maybe the end of next year? Well, end of next year, I mean... I'll give you two fights that in my head, like yeah. You know, I hope you say one I'm thinking of as well. Like fan fantasy wise, it would just yeah. mean one of them, which would mean a hell of a lot to me because you yeah. know the time when I, you know, the the saying that goes idol when your idols become rivals. I rivals. Think I think it's always a sportsman's dream to be able to fight their guy that they've been looking up to, yeah. or to be able to you know test their skills in the cage in a real life situation. I think it would yeah. make for a story. You know, John Jones said he's sitting out for two to three years. You know, if I can work my way my way up the ranks and get to the top, that'll be a fight I'll be looking to have because I know it would be absolutely amazing to be able to compete yeah. against such a great athlete. For me, that would be athletically one of the best, you know, one of the most momentous occasions ever. And I know, you know, obviously with the backstory behind it, we, you know, we, we spar before, we could sell well. So, you know, like I say, yeah. I'm visualising all these things and, and I know that's one big thing that I want to happen. Um, but at the end of the next year, to be honest, I, I'm looking at three fights this year and then another yeah. three four fights next year so if you look at right. fights i'm looking to be fighting for a title at the end of that time yeah. i'm looking for a title shot at least within two to three years like i say i'm i'm going towards the goal i'm going towards the top there's a hell of a lot of really good, good strong talent competition like people always underestimate the light heavyweight division i'm like have you seen the killers that are coming up like mm -hmm. it's not it's not a no joke situation anymore people are just looking past it because there's no big like the big names there yeah anymore. You know what I mean? Because they've all retired or they or, or or whatever. But like, there's some really, really talented fellas, and I know I'm gonna yeah. have a hell of a. You know, obviously, I believe in my skill set, and I believe I'm I'm gonna go in and beat all these guys. But at the end of the day, obviously, they're all very talented, and you know, you're gonna have to prepare, do everything necessary. Mm -hmm. and you have to work your way up the ranks. You know, we've got a, a large pool of talent, and like I said, I can't wait to gain more experience from each fight, keep getting better, and go out and put on spectacular performances for everyone. Mate, that would be quality. If, for me, I'd pick Johnny Walker. I mean, the styles there, just, oh, that would clash to make a wicked fight. But moving on now, obviously you were talking about it before. Without your dad, you you wouldn't probably wouldn't even be fighting. Tell us a bit about his upbringing and, and how he's brought you into the sport of MMA. So, you know, uh, pretty much all my family's Lithuanian. Uh, yeah. I'll born in Lithuania as well mm -hmm. which is why everyone's like you know looking at my name and then they hear my accent and they're like these two don't really fit do they yeah you know I mean? um but uh yeah so he was always an athlete his main sport at the beginning was swimming he was in the top 10 swimmers in Lithuania you know he mm -hmm. wanted to go to the Olympics and then due to medical problems he, he couldn't actually go and you know qualify and compete there which was one of his biggest dreams that was where he always tells me that was one of the things that he wanted to do he wanted to yeah. he wanted to, to go to the Olympics, which unfortunately didn't happen. But uh, like I say, he then went to the, because Lithuania was still part of the Soviet Union, he went to the Soviet Army. And during that time, I think either just before or during, he, he had got mm -hmm. his black belt in karate or I think, uh, yeah. I can't remember exactly when, but he'd, he'd realized that, you know, when there's, whenever there was more tougher opposition or bigger guys or whatever, he always had something for the fighting aspect. So yeah. he started learning and and developing a sort of own style, mixing the karate and the sambo together and, and the army type style, lifestyle and stuff like that. And, you know, he, he slowly then, like I said, developed his own art, getting to ask combat self-defense. And then, yeah, he just started competing and, you know, he, he, he got a hell of a lot of success. Again, he became one of the top 10 fighters in Lithuania and he actually became the uh, Soviet Union no holds barred heavyweight champion. So, that you know, crazy. <laughs> pretty easy feat to have, you know what I mean? He was mm. always tough, tough, 
cookie. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So um, one thing that he, you know, I also believe is that he probably could have done well at the at the early stages UFC, but he just never got the opportunity. You know, he yeah. retired before the UFC sort of came about. Um, but uh, and like I say, I, I was born pretty much a year later after the UFC came about. So yeah. Um, but yeah, and then you know when we moved back to to, to London and stuff like that. Uh, we, so when I was three years old, we moved to London, and then he started boxing. He wanted to get his boxing license for some reason. Again, the boxing license just didn't happen. They wouldn't allow him to do it. Um, so there was a lot of things. But you know, he's always very talented. He's always very good at it. And then he got to like five years old, and you know he's been training all his martial arts. You know, he's been doing his personal training and this and that. And then he thought. Do you know what? Um, why don't I teach my son a, 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 a couple of things? <laughs> it started off like very light, very easy. Oh, yeah, we're just going to do a couple of fancy kicks. And, oh, look how look how cool that is. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just five years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably about a month later, it's like, okay, Modesto, we will train hard now. I'm like, great. So literally <laughs> at five years old, I got, I got plunged into the world of uh, into the world of MMA and you know, really started uh, working on the kickboxing, and he also taught me sambo. And you know, like I say, he 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 taught me like the mixed martial arts, especially in the very early stages when no one else knew what it was. He knew what mm-hmm. it was. And started teaching me that, and then uh, I started competing uh, mainly in kickboxing, and I became a four-time British kickboxing champion. And then in the when I was fourteen was the last time I I fought for that title. And like I said, I I I, I stopped you know training martial arts properly when i was about 11 or 12 and oh, that right. title that i won was mm-hmm. when i wasn't even really training properly. i just sort of thought, ah do you know what there's a fight yeah. one. and it's funny because i was always bringing back trophies from fighting but then none of the other sports that i was training which was you know obviously always a tell sign that maybe at some point i want to go back to it when i went to america though um I went. I went when I was sixteen to eighteen. I tried to get a basketball scholarship. I played American football. So there, there was a whole load of, you know, different things that I tried out. But like I said, athletically, I, I became way, way more athletic, more explosive. All the strength and conditioning they had us do at sixteen, seventeen years old, guys lifting insanity weights. I'm like, how the like you never before see that in England ever no. in your life. So for me to go out there and get that sort of experience and that training was absolutely amazing. Um, but then yeah, when it when it were, when I got to 18, I realized, you know, there wasn't really any offers on the table. There might have been one, you know, Division three basketball college that was looking at me that, that there wasn't really anything else. Um, and, you know, it was my goal always to be a professional athlete and not only that, yeah. compete at the highest level. So my dad goes, listen, this is your last shot. Come back to fighting, <laughs> come back home and that's yeah. it. And that's pretty much it. And then I never looked back. So, like I said, I, I, I started doing it. My dad training me. And then uh, after that, uh, like after having a break, I think that break was good because mentally it made me more hungry to want to be back and to yeah, really yeah. realize that I that I'd love the sport, you know. Yeah, certainly. I, I want to talk about you going to Yaz Island, like I fought Island in a minute. But just before that, I want to talk about the your re- reality career in TV. Right. In time, yeah. now because. To be fair, I just wanted to, was it like a, a marketing, a way to get yourself out there? Or were you looking for a lady back then? Because the way you the market, it was quite well. And, and it must have got your name out there a bit more, to be fair. Oh, yeah. 100% definitely got my name out more. You know, I got more recognised. People were talking. Yeah. Sending, you know. But to be honest, it, it was a bit of just like, it's just a bit of like, why not? Like, it, yeah, like exactly. the way it came about, it's like I got a friend request from uh, uh, Lucy Cast or something, something rather. <laughs> And like, you know, me being the idiot that, oh, yeah, sure. I'll, that's yeah. I'll add her if it's a girl. Well, why not? And then, uh, and then yeah, it could go down to take me out application. I thought, oh, why not? I'll apply there. And then next thing you know, I'll fill in my application. And then um, about five minutes after I finished it, I got a call from an unknown number. And I'm like, nah, I ain't, I ain't about to be uh, done by a prank call right now. So I'm going to leave that. <laughs> about, about five minutes later, again, message on Messenger. Hey, this is yeah. thing for take me out. Can we have a mm-hmm. phone call? and then yeah things just developed and i finally got the audition so really for me i mean i just did it. i mean i asked my dad i said listen should i do it he goes yeah it's great yeah. for exposure and this and that exactly and it ended up being one of the best things in terms of for my exposure and yeah. uh for getting myself out there um you know what i mean and and like i say a couple of people were trying to tell me not to do it saying it might be bad publicity i'm like any publicity is bloody good you know it's good for so um and it just gave me a hell of a lot more confidence. I mean, since yeah. when 
you go shaking your ass in front of 30 girls, <laughs> you know, in front of a live audience, in front of pretty much national TV. And yeah, yeah. It just brought out the... I've, I real, really feel like that was the time when I really started to come out of my shell in yeah. terms of my personality and what I'm like and who I am because it gave me the sense of I have no fear. Like, I will go out there and do whatever, like, do whatever I can, be exactly who I want to be and not care. I think that was a real... <clears throat> I was almost like an epiphany in terms of yeah, yeah, like the breaking my, point. Uh, my sort of per- like just me as a person, just building my confidence, uh, building up my uh, resistance to sort of fear. Like fear now is like a drug. It's like an adrenaline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I embrace it and I love it. So anytime I do something crazy and I overcome it, I get such a rush. So not only does that help, you know, for, for, for me just in a, in, you know, just in a general sense, it also helps me in fighting because now I'm going out there with the intent of, I'm going to go and smash this guy. It doesn't matter yeah. what happens. I'm going to go and do my thing. So yeah, it was an amazing experience. Um, and yeah, like I said, it, it, it got me more in the public eye. And every time you talk about mm. you being on a TV show, it just opens up more doors later on. Mm. To be fair, I couldn't agree more. And, and as a uh, fan's perspective it, you connect more with a, a fighter when they like come out of their shell and show who their true colours are instead of just being sort of monotone and not really showing their true colours so big respect for that now obviously moving on to the big fight at Fight Island when are you going out there because everything's so it's sort of up in the air from a fan's perspective like no one really knows what's happening obviously you've got jet lag to worry about as well are you going out about a week before? Uh, well the UFC plans all the flights so uh they planned for us to be there on the 11th uh, yeah. on July. And then, um, yeah, so pretty pretty much you're there a couple of days before. You're going to get COVID tested like a million times. Yeah, um, I've you know, seen you that. You have to get quarantined in your room until you get your results back. And this, but obviously, you've got to safeguard. You've got, you've got to be, you know, you've got to be clever with this whole thing. But, yeah, I mean, listen, I don't know 100% like because they said we're going to have to get to the airport from here. Mm-hmm. I, one or two days before to get tested to either be oh right okay then we have to go you know fly out then you know mm. so really the time between then and the fight is not going to be a massive pit you know they they Dana White put a picture of the cage on the beach that's not the real cage oh, I was go I was going to say something like as fans the way they've marketed it is if you're going to be fighting on a beach God knows where you're staying like in a shack on the on the beach like with someone coming up to you one pound coconut drinks one pound shades. Yeah, like, that's the way it's been marketed as if that it's really like that, but it's just yeah. in an arena, isn't it? Yeah, that was for like the promo video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I originally thought it was going to be in the arena for where they fought uh, Habib and Poirier for, but apparently it's going to be a different one. Listen, they've oh, got right. facilities. The infrastructure that he built out there was more mm-hmm. for like just fighters to be around that particular arena okay. because I don't think there was any. So, uh, so it's like and- a fighter hotel, I'm guessing you'll be yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, and especially with COVID and stuff like that, they they wouldn't be able to drive people from Dubai into there. Like, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'd have to stay there for a certain amount of time. So you know, everything's been done professionally. Everything's been handled the way it should be handled from a business pers- perspective. So um, yeah, like I say, at the end of the day, I gotta go out and do my job. All of that is really just 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 white noise. I just uh, I'm I'm just concentrating on what I gotta do. It's a very exciting thing. Of course, I'm gonna be vlogging it all for you lot to see, but. Uh, but yeah, um, I can't wait till, till till we finally get to it. Right now, it's just like I say, just uh, last little preparations, and then yeah, we're we're, we're going to be out there and doing the business. Quality. Before I let you go, I got a quick fire round. You're right. So five questions. You ready? Yes, sir. Would you rather headline a show in Lithuania or London? Oh, 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 oh <laughs> that is I knew tough. You'd like, it's a good one. Um, I was going to add MSG, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to throw that into the mix. I would say the fan base is bigger in London. Yeah. So like the music that I would choose would get people hyped up. So I will mm. say London, <laughs> but but saying that, I mean, yeah. if they're a- ever able to get it out to Lithuania and bring the fan base there, that would be freaking epic. That would be like mm. a Conor McGregor in Ireland. So <laughs> that, that was too tough of a question. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> question mark kick or spinning back fist, what would you rather win by? Question mark kick. I thought you'd say that. Would you rather get poked in the eye, like, viciously or kicked in the nuts? Kicked in the nuts, man. I've been poked in the eye too many times. Bad, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. DC or Miocic 3, who wins? Oh, hit me with the hard ones, man. 
Oh, I want, like, I'm, oh, I don't know. I kind of want it's to tough, isn't it? I think DC's going to wrestle him. I think DC's got the edge. I would give DC. Yeah. yeah. And lastly, Marrera versus Bukalskis. Who wins and how? <laughs> I mean, come on now. <laughs> Let's go. Modestus by KO mm-hmm. in the first round. Love to see it. Right. That'll do, man. But really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on. And, and if you don't already know, I don't know how. But tune in July 15th, Fight Island. Can't wait. All right, my man. Thank you so much for having me, yeah? Cheers, man. Thanks. Have a good one.